Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, First Christian Church in Fort Smith. Uh, to our uh, online audience that'll be uh, watching later, and to uh, those of us here assembled, uh, First Christian Church is an open and affirming congregation. And this is a place where we say all means all. All are welcome to uh, our Sunday worships. All are welcome to uh, join us in communion when the time comes for that. Um, I want to uh, uh, extend greetings. Now, this is going to be the last time, I think, for Eric, Dennis, and Michael. They're stubborn. They keep coming back. Welcome. And uh, Max, good to see you, my brother. And uh, 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 to, to all here assembled, uh, good morning. Welcome to our uh, Pentecost celebration. On this, the 50th day of Easter, we commemorate when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples of Jesus Christ. And it is here we celebrate the recognized birth of the Christian church. Pentecost serves as a reminder of the ongoing presence and work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers and in the church. It is a time to reflect on the power of the Spirit to empower believers for ministry to guide us in our walk with God and to unify the diverse body of Christ. We celebrate Pentecost focusing on themes of spiritual renewal, empowerment for mission, and the unity of believers in the spirit. Would you please join us for our opening hymn on Pentecost they gathered, it's page 237 in your hymnal.
We come to our uh, announcements and our concerns and our celebrations. And uh, uh, first off on our uh, announcements, if you'd look on the uh, back side of your uh, bulletin, uh, there's a cabinet meeting tonight uh, at 6 p.m., followed by uh, ministry meetings. And we are reaching the end of our uh, fiscal year uh, and heading into our uh, changeover in personnel and uh, assignments. So be mindful uh, of that as we head into June and, uh, and thinking about how we uh, would like to serve the church in the year to come. Uh, May uh, 20th, tomorrow, is uh, the Disciples Men's Fellowship. We're going to be meeting here at 6.30. Uh, Jim Creekmore has, uh, uh, he, he's back in the hospital, and he was going to f uh, do food for tomorrow night, and that has now fallen upon me, and I haven't made a decision yet. <laughs> But uh, uh, so, something will happen. So there, we'll all be fed uh, tomorrow night at 6.30. Um, the Lunch Bunch will meet on Tuesday at the Lynx Barbecue, which is out on Custer Boulevard. It's on the golf course up on Fort Chaffee. If you haven't eaten there, Jim uh, is the one that recommended it, and it comes highly recommended from him and a few others. Uh, also on Tuesday at 4 p.m., this congregation is uh, serving at uh, Hope Campus. Uh, who's the point of contact for, who said that? There you go. And if you're interested in, in serving, see Ginger and about getting on board. Is that correct? Okay, all righty. Uh, then uh, let's see, uh, also on the 21st, the board nominating committee will meet Wednesday mornings at 8 o'clock, we have the ecumenical uh, men's Bible study. It meets down here and uh, is a, a, a group of uh, good men uh, studying uh, uh, New Testament at the time. I think it's the Book of John. And then uh, last and not least comes the Crazy Crafters on Thursday. Right? There you go. Crazy Crafters on Thursday at 10 o'clock. Um, then uh, let's talk about uh, prayer concerns first. Oh, Jim is back in the hospital, and what I know from Linda is that he has some uh, internal bleeding that they haven't been able to find the source of. And he's been doing some transfusions. Those transfusions are keeping him going. They are still on the hunt. And... Uh, and this is as of last night, 10 o'clock. So any, anything else to add to that? Okay. All righty. Please keep Jim and Linda in your prayers. They, they, they just got a thing going over there. Uh, other prayer concerns in the congregation? Yes. Yes, ma'am. May 28th, Leslie's going to be having ear and nose surgery. All right. Prayers for you. Lifted thoughts, young lady. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, sir. I wanted everybody to know how Sloan was doing our great wedding ceremony. Yes. Um, prayers have been answered. He turned around and is doing so much better. They uh, removed the vent. He's not even taking oxygen. And he hope, we hope that he gets to come home this week. Yeah. All so right. thank you all for your prayers. And you were kind of under a microphone. Did everybody hear that? Okay, all righty. Thank you for sharing that. Wonderful. Any others? All right, celebrations, anniversaries, birthdays. The good news. Here we go. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, sir. Big news in the Jackson family, Diana's nephew, 
had a son. Yes. Okay, and a grandson is getting baptized. Yes. In the ja yeah, good news for the Jackson family. Thank you. Thank you. To the pleasure of most everybody, surprise of many, my uh, grandson Hunter graduated this last week. <laughs> That's not what you call a statistical anomaly or anything. That's, that's, that's a good deal. Others? Anyone? Leslie. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this Saturday is Tim's birthday. Saturday is Tim's birthday. <laughs> the 25th. And any, any other additional information related to that birthday you wish to share? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, Tim. Cough it up. Okay. All righty. Okay. Thank you all. Does that conclude it? All righty, thank you. Um, so now I want to uh, welcome, I got to make sure that I'm, I'm on pace here. I want to welcome our, uh, our uh, guest pastor this, e or this morning, uh, Reverend Dr. Mike Jones and his good wife, Nan. Nan, raise your hand. There you go. All righty. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Jones uh, is, uh, as you all heard last week, is uh, brought here uh, at, as a guest for uh, uh, Dr. Robinson. And uh, he is recently retired from the Mercy Hospice where he served as the bereavement coordinator and chaplain for 11 years. He's a retired chaplain of the U.S. Air Force Reserve, served churches in Missouri, Kentucky, and Arkansas, and for the last 10 years, Mike and his good wife, Nan, have ministered together at the Wood Memorial Christian Church in Van Buren. Mike graduated from Harding University with a degree in biblical studies, earned his Master of Divinity uh, at Harding Graduate School, and his uh, PhD comes from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, Dr. Jones, welcome on behalf of First Christian Church, would you please come and lead us in our call to worship, invocation, and Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, I'm sorry. Call to worship. I was wondering why everyone stood up. It wasn't me. All right, let's do this right. Sorry. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless God's name. Proclaim God's salvation from day to day. And now we'll pray. Holy Father, we give you thanks. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for watching out for us in ways that we don't even know. Thank you for Jesus on the cross. Thank you for grace and mercy. Lord, we thank you for new births in the Jackson family and for the baptism of a grandson, a new child of yours. We thank you for Hunter and all the others who have graduated and are graduating. Quite an accomplishment. And we just thank you for being with us. Lord, we ask that you hear our prayers on behalf of Jack and Joy Jackson and Jeannie Stebner and Sloan Fargo and Jim and Linda Creekmore and Cherry Rains and Leslie. And Father, there are no doubt unspoken heart requests that we just don't give voice to. But you know what we ask and what we need. We pray that your will would be done in our lives and in the lives of those that we love. Be with us throughout this service and give Ellis and Sabrina a safe trip home. For we pray in Jesus' name. And let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, is an American-born denomination with origins in the early 19th century American frontier. Since their beginning, the Disciples of Christ have endeavored to increase respect, understanding, and unity among believers in Jesus Christ. As disciples, we strive to follow the teachings of Jesus and the New Testament by practicing a faith that is socially relevant and intellectually sound. Members are bound together in fellowship and service by belief in the central confession of the New Testament that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. On other matters, the church recognizes each member's right to exercise freedom of opinion this principle is a sustaining force in the life of the church. We hold that there be in essentials unity, in opinion, liberty, and in all things love. Our Pentecost offering, which is being given today, will help to birth new and aid in growing disciples of Christ churches so that these beliefs will be available to any Christian in the United States that finds that our denomination might coincide with their ideas of what the church means to them. This offering supports the specialized ministry of new church development through both regional and general programs. Money giving for this offering is divided equally between the region in which it is given and the new church ministry. Your gifts to this 2024 Pentecost offering will help to make these things possible. Please give as you're led. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Grateful for that. Today's scripture lesson comes from Psalm 77, it's on page 467 of your pew Bible, and I double-checked that for those that caught, was it last week or week before that we had the wrong page number in there, but we got that confirmed today. And uh, this uh, will be verses 1 through 10 of the 77th Psalm. <clears throat> I cry aloud to God, aloud to God that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. I think of God and I moan, I meditate, and my spirit faints. You keep my eyelids from closing. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old and remember the years of long ago. I commune with my heart in the night. I meditate and search my spirit. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love ceased forever? 
Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And I say, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, you know, visiting pastors would just soon get it all perfectly right. And I have flubbed it up two or three times already. So I don't have to worry about being perfect. <laughs> so I'm just going to be me. First, I want to thank Diane and the choir, and Brad and Randy. And uh, I want to tell you a story about Ellis before I actually start with Psalm 77. <laughs> I hear he's been telling stories about me. <laughs> so I started with Mercy in 2009. I was on the hospice side. Ellis worked on the hospital side, both chaplains, but we, didn't, we weren't even in the same department. But we'd have lunch together, he and the other eight hospital chaplains and me. And uh, later on, they pulled the hospice chaplains into the department for the hospital, so not only did I get to do my hospice wing, uh, but I got to work throughout the whole hospital whether I wanted to or not. And trust me, that's a whole different setting. Well, 
Along with that new duty came weekends. I didn't have to work weekends in hospice, but when you were one of the hospital chaplains, you rotated weekends, which meant you came in on Saturday from 7.30 till about 5 or 6, and then you went home and you were on call. And you know, they still use those little nasty beepers. And I say nasty because the one I had had no volume control and it was set to loud. And so if you were asleep when it went off, I, would, I used to stress, and can verify, I couldn't go to sleep when I knew I had the pager on because I was waiting for it to jar me out of sleep. So one Saturday I go into work, it's my weekend, and by the way, you're by yourself. There's no other chaplain there. All day, all night, all Sunday, you don't get off until about five or six o'clock Sunday night. So it's a long shift. So I came in one Saturday morning, it was my weekend, and I just didn't feel quite right, but hey, it's your weekend and there's no backup. So I go in and I got there about 7, 7.30 and I'm doing the stuff and I'm just about ready to get out, get out on the floor. And Ellis walks in, which wasn't unusual. For some reason, he seemed to think he needed to show up around nine or 10 o'clock on a Saturday, even when he wasn't working. And he walked in and he looked at me and he said, you don't look too good. And I said, I don't feel too good. I think I got a fever, but I got to work. And he said, oh, okay. And about 20 minutes later, he came back and said, I just called Sabrina and told her I was going to work the weekend. Why don't you go home? I was sick until Wednesday when I returned to work. So I was sick. But he took my weekend, and he worked all day Saturday, on call Saturday night. I don't remember if he got called in, but it wouldn't have been unusual to get called in four or five times. And then work all day Sunday. And he did it on the spur of the moment, and he didn't have to do it. That's the kind of pastor you have. And he'll do that for you when you have a need. He'll be there. That's when Ellis and I really became good friends. It didn't hurt that I gave him a $50 gift certificate to Red Lobster or something either. <laughs> but, you know, not that I had to bribe him. But that's, that's Ellis. And I will never forget that. And frankly, I don't know if I'd have done the same. It was a lesson. Well, let's get into Psalm 77. Um, Brad, when we were talking about reading and everything, he said, you know, this is... Those first 10 verses are really a downer, and he is absolutely right. There's only, I guess there's a couple of Psalms that might be worse. Psalm 13, by the way, is, oh my goodness, that, don't read that when you're in, having any depressive thoughts. It's tough. But 77 is a tough Psalm. It starts out really hard. Asaph, Asaph had been assigned by King David back in the time before the temple, to be the leader of the temple singers that sang before the Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary. And so he wrote, we have at least, uh, well, Psalm 50 and then 73 through 83 are the psalms that are ascribed to him. And what I love about Psalm 77 is it's honesty. It's honesty. Now, I originally read this in the New Living Translation, which is a little different than your new Revised Standard Version. So I'm going to read those verses again with that, because I'm going to use that. And I want us to talk about this. And I want us to wrestle with this psalm. Uh, and I think we'll be better for it. Pray we are. I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long I prayed with lifted hands toward heaven. But my soul was not comforted. I think of God 
and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. You don't let me sleep. I'm too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days long since ended when my nights were filled with joyful songs. I search my soul and ponder the difference now. In this psalm, Asaph is clearly struggling with something, a situation perhaps. We, we don't know for sure. But it was causing him deep trouble. He prayed and prayed and was never comforted. He couldn't sleep at night. Eventually, he became so weary and overwhelmed that he was too distressed to keep praying. He was worn out. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that way? 20 years ago, I went on a diet. In five weeks, I lost 40 pounds. It was not a diet of choice. It was a critical situation going on in my life. I averaged two hours a night. I probably ate maybe 250 to 500 calories a day. I don't know, I wasn't counting them, but I wasn't eating either. And then in the middle of the night, when I couldn't sleep, I'd get up and go run. At the time I was in a hotel, I would go into the gym with the permission at three o'clock in the morning and watch reruns of Star Trek and ride miles and miles on an exercise bike. When I read those words for the first time, that was what I thought of. That was that time in my life. I prayed and prayed and prayed. I got so tired of praying. And I wondered, why me? Why this? Well, maybe you can relate. Asaph, verses 7 through 10, asks a series of questions. There's six questions, but actually they're couplets. Two questions, the second one just kind of amplifies the first, and there's three sets. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? And I said, Asaph, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand. If you've ever been there, and you can relate. Now, I want to try to modernize this a little bit. We don't know the situation behind Asaph's words. So let me, let me tell you three stories. I want to introduce to you three very real stories of people of faith suffering with grief, and anguish, and doubt. The first story is of a couple who experienced the pain and grief of seven miscarriages. Here was a Christian couple who desperately wanted children but were denied them in such a painful and agonizing way. What are they to make of this? The second story involves two people who are very important to me in my early walk with the Lord, Mike and Marilyn Montgomery. Mike was a deacon at our church and he worked with the youth. And he and his wife Marilyn were wonderfully beautiful Christians who loved the Lord with all their hearts. However, a number of years ago, Mike was diagnosed with cancer. 
One day I called and talked with Marilyn, and as she shared what was going on with Mike, she also shared that they were struggling financially. Mike was the majority breadwinner. He had a business. She was a teacher at a Christian school, which means she didn't get paid very much. And Mike couldn't work, and they were struggling. However, just a few days before I had called, Marilyn found out that her teaching job was being eliminated. And now she wasn't sure what they were going to do. How were they going to get along? The third story involves a teacher I know who a number of years ago decided not to return to a teaching job she had in a city way up in the northwest corner of northwest Arkansas. There wasn't anything wrong. It's just that wasn't where she needed to be. So without having a job and totally uncertain of her future, she put her house up for sale and came to this area where she slept on her daughter's couch. Can you imagine the fear and the stress she must have experienced, wondering what her future held? Asaph, he felt such anguish, such agony. He had such doubt. He was so dejected that he said in verse 10, This is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. But, but the psalm doesn't end there. Asaph's story doesn't end there. Not by a long shot. Listen to what happened. Listen to what Asaph did. And as you relate to where he was in those first 10 verses, and you wonder about what's going on in your life right now, learn from Asaph. Asaph remembered. That's it. He remembered. He looked up past his anguish and his distress and his doubts. He forced his eyes and his heart to look past the hopelessness of his situation, and he focused on God, and he remembered. And that made all the difference. Let me read, starting in verse 11, again from the New Living Translation. But then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They're constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Asaph thought about, reminded himself of all the things God had done. He remembered. He remembered he wasn't alone. He remembered that God had done some wonderfully powerful things in the past, and he could still do them in his day. Verse 13, O God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? Are you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. By your strong arm you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Asaph remembers the key event in the history of the Hebrews. God bringing them out of Egypt. We know that because he mentions Jacob and Joseph. Joseph is tied to that story. But we know it too because in verse 16 he says, When the Red Sea saw you, O God, the waters, its waters looked and trembled, the sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured down rain, the thunder rumbled in the sky, your arrows of lightning flashed. 
Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Asaph is remembering that exodus where the Hebrews, a million or more, the estimates kind of vary, but there was a bunch of them, were standing on the shore facing the Red Sea, trying to figure out how to cross it when the Egyptian army is behind them, bearing down hard because they're going to kill them. They're going to destroy them. The enemy is to their back, and they can't go anywhere because of the Red Sea. Asaph remembers that. And then he says, Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. You led your people along the road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron and his shepherds. Moses raises the staff and the Red Sea parts. And the path across has now opened up. And while there was nothing but water from their perspective, now there was a path through the sea that no one had seen. No one knew it was there, except God. So the Hebrews were saved. They crossed the Red Sea on that path, and then the sea closed up and allowed not one Egyptian soldier to cross. A pathway no one knew was there. Remember that couple who suffered seven miscarriages? During the wife's seventh pregnancy, she had a dream. This woman was a Caucasian woman. But in her dream, she's holding a baby, and when it turns and looks at her, the baby is Asian. She had the dream two nights in a row. And on the day following the second night, she had her seventh miscarriage. But two years later, two years later, she's standing in China holding her brand new baby girl. A Chinese baby girl. A pathway she couldn't see. No one knew was there. God cleared the way. Marilyn lost her job. The same day I called was the day that the doctors told her and Mike that his cancer was getting worse. The week before, she had lost her job. The thing was, Mike was so bad that he couldn't care for himself at home during the day because Marilyn was working and so was their adult son. But now Marilyn could stay with him during the day. What was thought to be a terrible thing, losing her job, turned out to be a pathway no one knew was there. So for the last few weeks of his life, Marilyn was able to be with him and share the joy and the laughter and the tears to be together. That teacher who only two weeks earlier had come to stay with her daughter, sleeping on her couch, well, that took place in June of 2004. 
And on, in that month, she was offered a teaching job, received a good offer on her former house, and made the winning bid on another house. The thing was, it wasn't just all in June. Those three things happened all on the same day. And that's how my wife, Nan, came to live in Barling. And while it's a story for another day, if she had stayed in Gravit instead of coming down to Barling, I never would have met her. A few pathways. So what's my point? My point is this. Asaph was going through a really tough time. And he was praying, he was doing everything right, and yet he felt alone. And then he remembered God. Those Hebrews had no way out until God revealed a path they couldn't even see through the Red Sea. That couple had no way out until God revealed a pathway they couldn't see either. It led to China, and it led to an adoption. Marilyn didn't know at the time that losing her teaching job would have been the best thing that happened, not the worst. And Nan didn't know when she left and came down to Barling how things were going to turn out. But she trusted the Lord. And he revealed a path that she couldn't have written a book or a better ending. Don't give up. Even when you feel hopeless and lost and you can't see a way out, don't give up. Do like Asaph. Remember God. Remember that he is the God of all gods. There is no God like him. He is the God of great wonders. He is the God that will lead you on a pathway that you can't even see yet. But he will. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for uh, being here and sharing the message. We're going to sing now together, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It's number 254. If you'd stand for our communion hymn, please. Thank you.
I heard that one coming. It's Pentecost Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Miss Dan, when you when we exit here, uh, when he and I leave here at the end of the service, would you join us, please, so that uh, the congregation can say hello and. Uh, There we go. All right. This uh, table is open to all. All means all. Through the observance of communion, individuals are invited to acknowledge their faults and their sins, to remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to remember their baptism, and to give thanks for God's redeeming love. Because disciples believe that the invitation to the table comes from Jesus Christ, communion is open to all who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, regardless of your affiliation or denomination. Communion is the symbolic presence of Jesus within our gathered community, and this table is open to all. Since 1967, the 12 walls of this uh, building and the three sides of this uh, table, the, the stippled metalwork and uh, this cross made of uh, horseshoe nails, these are all designed to bring our attention, our focus, and our thoughts to the state of humility centered on what, it is, on what is about to occur at this table. Last night, I had the pleasure of uh, having dinner uh, with uh, the daughter or the granddaughter. I can't remember exactly what she said, but uh, the Packard family that brought our Rosetta over from Europe so long ago. This table symbolizes our very purpose for assembling as a church. It is at this table that we partake of the elements of communion as instructed by Jesus at the Last Supper and give our resources as instructed by Moses. It symbolizes our profession of love for and dedication to our Creator's human embodiment in Jesus Christ. This table, built by grateful and talented men, symbolizes our dedication, our commitment, our service as followers of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the Lord's table. And as we come to partake communion today, and present our tithes, please approach from the outside aisles, return to your uh, pews from the center aisle. If there are any wish who, uh, who wish to take their communion uh, where they're seated, please let us know and a deacon will serve you. Uh, Dr. Jones, will you please come up or offer up our words of institution? From the Apostle Paul written to the church in Corinth, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
God, we offer ourselves to thee to build with us and to do with us as thou wilt. Relieve us of the bondage of self that we may better do thy will. Take away our difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those we would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. Beloved Creator, we are now willing that you should have all of us, good and bad. We pray, we pray that you now remove from us every single defect of character which stands in the way of our usefulness to you and to our fellows. Grant us strength as we go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. invitation of discipleship. If there's anyone here who wishes to publicly profess Jesus as Lord, unite with this church in membership or make a rededication to discipleship, you are invited to come forward now and speak with me or one of the church leaders, or we'll probably tell you wait till next week and talk to Ellis. <laughs> Brad told me to say that. But now is the time. If you'd like to make your wishes known, please let us know as we sing the invitation hymn, number uh, 253. and I want to thank you for being so gracious to us and allowing us to be here this morning. It's been our honor to worship with you. May you go in God's peace. May you always remember, you may not see the pathway, but God always does. And you can trust in that. Go in peace. <laughs>